Hello everyone and welcome back to the Great Book of Grudges. My name is Nathan and today we're going to be continuing our State of the Faction series. And we're going to focus on the Lizard Men today, mostly because... Look, the Lizard Men got a lot of attention in Warhammer 2. Three DLCs, in fact, and two FLCs, leading to the Lizard Men having seven legendary lords by the end of Game 2, which is absolutely incredible. The issue is that the Lizard Men were always teamed up against a faction which got the most of the attention. Tehenuin versus Ikit Claw, for example. The Skaven, we're going to get all the attention there. The Hunt and the Beast, well, most of the attention went towards the Empire and their adjoining rework, and then finally the Silence and the Fury, which was really good for the Lizardmen faction, but just that specific one with Oxyotl. So as you can see, the Lizardmen didn't really get any quality of life updates, which was quite problematic. They've kind of fallen behind. It's not just against the scope of Game 3 now, because let's be honest, the factions and races in Game 3 have a lot more going for them. It's more the case that they've just, they fell behind in Game 2. Now, we know that Creative Assembly have their sights set on the Lizardmen in the future, we just don't know exactly what scope and scale, but I would say that they do need a rather lengthy rework to make all the factions a little bit different, and also fix up some major problems with the Lizardmen as a whole. I do think they could do with another DLC too, which could take them up to eight Legendary Lords. Yeah, I know it's quite a lot, but to be honest, there's a lot to cover when it comes to the Lizardmen. So let's get started and let's talk about the possible rework first. So let's get started with their biggest issue, at least in my opinion. It's the absolutely atrocious tech tree. So you need to build up some buildings to kind of get started with it, right? If you want to get with the spawnings for the skinks, you have to build up the skink building, so on and so forth. But then afterwards, as you get a few techs in, you have to build up another building, which is like the scrying pool to go into the middle. And then afterwards, you need the star chamber and the weapons crafter commune. Now, these are buildings that sometimes you'll build up naturally, but in other cases, you won't. There is way too much reliance on building up some buildings to actually progress through a tech tree. It's not like many other races have the same situation. So in order to progress through your tech tree, you're gonna to have to build up stuff that you might not need, wasting cash, and it's gonna slow you down because by the point that you get there, you could have forgotten about it. It happens to the best of us. So yeah, I don't see why this tech tree is still here, especially when all the other races don't really have too much of a problem. Sure, there are some factions like the High Elves where you need to build some specific buildings to get uh, more infrastructure-based stuff and so on. And there are prerequisites for the Dark Elves and the Skaven, but the way that those are designed is just way less annoying. You can focus on the areas that you do want and it's just a lot better without having to go from one section to another section to another section. It's Frustrates it. Honestly, I would have just seen the tech tree for the Lizardmen done in the form of a pyramid, starting from the very bottom and then branching out into different locations of said pyramid, and that would allow you a little bit more give way without having to go through one line, two lines, three lines, four lines. It's, it's just kind of boring as it stands right now. I mean, just put it this way, I'm here, this is turn one with Mazda Mundi, fresh campaign, and I can't click on a tech to start off with. I don't think any other race has no tech from the very beginning. Well, barring Daniel, but Daniel doesn't really count. Construction-wise, I think a few things need to change. For example, if you want to unlock Temple Guard, Horned Ones, and Sacred Croxagors, you also need to build a Weapons Crafter Commune. It means that you've got to focus around so heavily on getting one thing, getting another thing. It's, it's one on-off building too, so it kind of screws over your planning for certain buildings and certain settlements, which might not be too large. Hexotal is a 10 slaughter, well, technically seven, because you do want those landmarks too. You see what I mean when it comes to that? You're gonna wanna say, well, I'm gonna have to dedicate this town to just Sora stuff, but I also want to pick up this. I want some infrastructure buildings, some defense buildings. There definitely needs to be a little bit of a facelift here to kind of give you more reason to get certain unit buildings and certain other buildings at the same time. There's too many one and done slotters here too, which is actually why people get frustrated with the tech tree and with the geomantic web, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But a little bit of a facelift here would be absolutely fantastic just to make things a little bit more bearable. With just a very basic idea, I would say move the Saurus down to tier 1, which means that then the shielded Saurus would be tier 2, and the Temple God would be considered tier 3, but then on top of that, put the Cold One building there. It does mean that it's going to take a little bit more time to get your hands on some Cold One Riders, 
but it's going to make a little bit more space for you to kind of build up your settlements so it might even out. But yeah, a big issue with the lizard men is something that everyone's been talking about. It's the geomantic web, a system which is basically go to this area, capture it. It's usually a capital to focus on the ones that are linked up to you. And with that, you'll be able to get some bonuses. The bonuses themselves do vary and you can make those bonuses a little bit better by building a geomantic pylon, which goes all the way up to a geomantic locus. It's cool i guess but the problem is that in some cases when you start looking through it they're going to take you to areas where you're going to have to fight with factions that you don't want to fight with and you see the bonuses aren't too bad in theory it's just they're very focused on province wide and the areas that you've already conquered uh, extra growth and so on whereas if the bonuses also had some faction wide bonuses stuff to actually make your faction a lot stronger as you progress to give you more reason to build up the web you'd be incentivized a lot more to go through it that's the big thing people want to be incentivized to go okay well now I have to go down south and fight all these factions, get rid of the Hunts Marshal, Alberic, and so on, or take over Ulfwan because, yeah, there's a lot of pylons there I could take advantage of. Honestly, I'd say kind of copy the chivalry mechanic, essentially, from the Bretonians. Uh, you know, that bar at the top, which allows you to get some bonuses for your faction. Well, something like that, with the more pylons and the more connections you have to the geomantic web, the stronger that bar gets. Something very basic, but it would be great quality of life, which at the end of the day, this is what the Lizardmen need. They don't need a full rework, barring the tech tree, I think, but they definitely do need some quality of life changes here and there. Now, in terms of the characters themselves, I don't think that we need to see everyone getting reworked. At the end of the day, Tehenuin is fine, Oxyotl is perfect, he's very, very fun to play. Nakai could do with a minor change, so we're going to talk about him first. Really, the only thing I'd say is, can they just make the Vassal faction active to be able to build up a little bit? Playing as Nakai is fun. The Horde faction is fun. It's actually a, quite a really interesting way of playing the Lizardmen. The problem is that when you're getting into wars, and it does happen because obviously player bias and so on, your Vassal faction ends up becoming something that you have to babysit. There are naturally ways to avoid this in vanilla. There are ways to get into war without your vassal doing anything. But the fact that they don't do anything, and I'm not saying they go out and declare war and stuff, but have them build up armies, have them build up their infrastructure, have them do stuff to just exist, right? Rather than just being a no AI faction, essentially. There was a mod a long time ago that actually did do this. I'm not sure if it's been updated ever since, but it did make the faction a little bit easier to play because you don't have to focus on uh, is this faction actually doing anything? Are they defending themselves? Are they just dying out super quick? Mazda Mundi being the only slant legendary lord should really have something around determining the great plan, to be honest. A series of dilemmas which would then say, okay, now go kill High Elves. Or depending on how you answered, go kill Dark Elves, go kill this, go kill that. It could be a fun roleplay aspect and there could be a cooldown for you to use it. The idea here would be going through the lore, which would sometimes cause more problems for the lizard men than expected. This is why there's some lore aspects of, yeah, you know, the lizard men were trading with the High Elves really, really well. And then... Nope, they decided they gotta go. It could honestly be very fun. I could see it tying into another campaign, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But the idea is, you know, give that lore aspect, this major lore aspect for the slan to Mazda Mundi. So he's got something a little bit different. And it's not like it's going to be too difficult because we do have dilemmas already. And these types of things have already appeared before, like the Nemesis Crown or even some quests where multi dilemmas can kind of change things and what the result's going to be. I think it would work. I don't know. I've been thinking about this a lot in relation to Mazda Mundi. And this mechanic could actually tie in rather nicely to Krokgar. You see, story-wise in game, he's gone into the Southlands because he was sent over to deal with some problems. So what if it tied in quite nicely to the campaign idea I had for Mazda Mundi, where you might get some missions sent to you directly from Mazda Mundi. Go eliminate this faction, go eliminate that faction, get some nice bonuses for your faction if you do so. Which in truth is very similar to that of Blessed Spawnings, but the idea here would be, you know, a little bit more faction-wide bonuses rather than just 
hey, a item and that. It could even spawn in some armies for you to fight directly. You know how Malachi has some random armies spawning in so you can go and fight them for his quests? It'd be like that but not as detailed because a recreation of that would better be suited for other characters and not so much this lad here. It could be even done in a special way that if you are ending up playing as Mazda Mundi and someone else is playing as Krokgar, there could be like a synergy quest line there for them. Could be cool. I don't know. I, I'm thinking about it like that. It would be a multiplayer exclusive thing. Or maybe if you're playing as Mazda Mundi, you could be sending stuff to NPC Krokgar. But hey, that's just an idea. It's just kind of popped in as I'm editing the video. So yeah. <laughs> Creative Assembly have put Gorok as a defensive faction. And I kind of like the idea of it. You know, you get defensive supplies and even barriers for your units when you're defending settlements. So why not take this a step further? Why not put him in charge of the defense of Lustria? Do you remember the whole situation with Miao Yin? She does have a unique mechanic which focuses around the defense of the Great Bastion stopping enemies from coming in. Well, what if he had something like that? Focusing on the defense of Lustria where enemy armies will spawn demonic incursions, greenskins, it could vary. And the more that you unite Lustria, the less that they end up spawning. You can end up getting the whole country sorted, build up a building, maybe with the whole geomantic web, and stop them all together because one problem that uh, Miao Yin has is that that thing is just permanent for some reason. I'm not sure if they fixed that for Miao Yin, it's been a while to be honest, I prefer playing Zhao Ming, but yeah, it would be nice to just get something kind of themed. Even though he's supposed to be more the aggressive guy, Chakax the Eternity Warden is supposed to be the defensive one. Um, they've kind of switched that around and still we don't have Chakax, but we'll be talking about Chakax a little bit soon. Now I'm going to be very very honest with you, I don't know what could be done with Teto Echo. I'll leave that for you guys to throw some ideas out because, yeah, it's a character that I really do believe should have been a legendary hero. I mean, it's fine if he gets nothing because he does have quite a lot going for him with pretty much, you know, the pterodons always being there and stronger pterodons in general. But he just doesn't strike me as anyone too particularly interesting, I guess... I don't know. It's one of these things where I know I'm not the only one where you think about lizard men and you tend to think about the really cool ones. Teto Echo is just, you know, skink on a pterodon. Now, like I said, we have seven legendary lords. It's a lot of characters for a race that didn't really get that much attention in terms of quality of life. I could see them getting one more. I'll be very honest with you. The idea here is there's still a few things for the Lizardmen that are missing. Admittedly, their roster is actually really good. It's far better than what we had on the tabletop. There's stuff here that just either existed as a supplement or existed in long, long ago editions. It's nice to see quite a lot coming here. And I'm pretty happy in terms of what they have. I don't think that they're lacking on anything Lord and Hero-wise for generics. Obviously, some legendary characters would be great. If anything, for a Lord option, a Skink High Priest would be cool. So you have a Spellcaster Lord, which isn't just the Slan. Maybe could work out quite well. It wasn't really too much of a thing on the tabletop, but it could be done. And we do know that Skink High Priest do exist in the lore. They've actually existed in the lore for some time. But other than that, I think Lord and Hero-wise, they're kind of done. After that, it's about adding in some stuff just to kind of flesh them out and finish up the race altogether. All right, I'm coming in with an edit here as I think that this could actually work out. What if they did something which more or less fits Oxyotl more, but would kind of fit everyone? Having a Chameleon Skink Lord or Hero or both, it would be kind of nice because when it came to Oxyodal, you're the stealth faction and you don't really have stealth Lord and Heroes. So finally seeing that implemented would make his campaign a lot more thematic. And yeah, you could just have like essentially Skink Assassin armies moving around with loads of Chameleon Skinks with different other armies too and different factions. It's just a very basic idea, but I think it could work. I know that a lot of people have been using mods for that. And to be honest, I've been kind of doing the same thing, but... Yeah, it just came into me now as I was preparing to, you know, render the video to release today. So let's go with some interesting stuff that's actually missing. Colchins, a blast from the past, second edition actually, which a long, long time ago. But they do exist in the lore. We do know that colchins are basically used for their uh, very vibrant plumes. Lizard men use them for their headdresses and so on. And sometimes as mounts, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Colchins exist. The colchin planes are in the game. And they are... Yeah, carnivorous animals, terror birds, essentially. 
Most people kind of joke around them being dodos because technically they weren't really that good back in the day. So this would be a fast moving unit of various different birds, maybe like a group of 16, maybe more. But it would be like the answer to the Warhounds. They wouldn't be as fast as Warhounds, that's for sure. But I think it could be kind of cool, to be honest. I mean, why not, right? End of the day, they would be kind of cool to see implemented. It was old artwork that we saw a dragon turtle, a coatl, and a colchin, I believe, for second edition. And since they brought back the coatl into the game, I mean, it's very, very possible that we could see the colchins come in too. Not only that, but we could see them being done in various forms. This as the monster variant, and then a second variant with skink riders on them. So this is another thing that existed way back in the day, and it would be kind of cool to see, because that means that you could have a skirmishing cavalry, because, well, the cold ones are more shock. You could have these fast dudes with blowpipes shooting as they move, and spears too to, you know, get a little bit of a decent charge in. I don't imagine these doing a lot of damage, but it would be kind of cool to see that happen, especially if you're that guy who likes to play with full skink armies. Theming is quite important. If you're playing as Tehenuin, you'd probably want to use these. If you're playing as maybe Tetoeko, if we do end up getting them in the future, we'll talk about them a little bit later on in the video. Again, skink armies just kind of fit. Having some skink cavalry, even better. Now, if Grave Assembly want to do something that wouldn't be too interesting, but would definitely play on a lot of people's nostalgia, Skink Archers. Yeah, going back to 5th edition. You remember that Bretonia versus Lizardmen box, which the Saurus looked absolutely atrocious? The Bretonians held up really well, though. Yeah, skink archers were a thing, and it would be kind of nice to get some better range. I think the largest range that you kind of have with the blowpipes at the moment... No, the javelins uh, is 80. So, yeah, give them a range bow with 120 range. Why not? Again, it's more about your skinks and going with loads of different types of skinks. It's a basic unit, but people do appreciate basic units too. I'm just thinking about it mostly because of nostalgia's sake, because nostalgia does really come into play when it comes to these DLCs a lot. And yeah, I mean, a lot of people might like to play with some skink bowmen. Now, the big problem is there's not really a lot of stuff missing. We could talk about, for example, the Arcanodon or the Thunder Lizard. Keep in mind that both things that you're seeing are fan-made creations. They were actually featured, I believe, one in the Illustria book and the other in the uh, Warhammer Chronicles? Could have been. But we don't have, like, official representation of what they look like. I mean, it would be kind of cool, but we've already got the Dread Saurian. I wouldn't mind if Games Workshop allowed Creative Assembly to be a little bit more creative. Roll credits here. And, yeah, give us some big beasties, absolute titanic creatures, similar in style to the Dread Sword, so you wouldn't be able to doomstack them, you'd have to kind of work around to be able to get them. I don't know, I think something like this could work out really well. Or maybe Games Workshop do have some stuff that was originally planned for Warhammer Fantasy, something that never came into effect but had concept art and so on, and then just appeared out of nowhere. I think something like that is doable. I'd love to see something done, because, well, they don't need big beasties, but it would just be nice to get something to go, oh wow, fresh and new and exciting. We had something like that when it came to, like, the the Doom Knights of Zinch for Warhammer Freeze launch, and that was really kind of cool. And we know that there's a lot of stuff that never actually got released. Uh, there's obviously those talks about the uh, Dwarf Steam Tank, and then uh, we had that Bretonian Lord come out recently. There's a lot of stuff which just doesn't really see the light of day. It's also very well known that, yes, there were originally some plans for a 9th edition Warhammer Fantasy. Some stuff was written in terms of concept. The stuff that, from earlier editions, I believe me, I've spoken to a lot of X Games Workshop staff, and it's like, oh my god, some stuff was created, some stuff was even done as a proto-model, and then nothing appears. <laughs> it just sucks, because it feels like my collection's incomplete when it comes to my models knowing that there's something hidden away in some deep, dark vault in Nottingham of all places. And then for all the Legendary Lord, I mean, it's pretty simple, Tatoeko. It's a character that has been kind of hinted in the game before, and let's be honest, it would be kind of unique. He is a skink spellcaster, and I know that might sound a little bit like, well, Big Whoop, but Tatoeko is the greatest of the skink priests that has ever existed, and he is incredibly 
incredibly respected by the temple guard, even by other slan, so much so that he has his own palanquin. And I think it could be kind of cool to see this happen because his special ability is that he is a chief astronomer. He is so good at that that he can predict when shit's gonna go down, when the Skaven starts preparing an invasion, when there's demons afoot or anything, he's actually been known to send out Gorog, Oxyotl, and other characters when he's been able to divine these massive problems coming. Essentially, it's been said in the lore that when Tetoeko has been involved in any situation regarding the Lizardmen, the Lizardmen have not lost a battle because he is a number of steps ahead of his enemy. So this has allowed the Lizardmen to prepare themselves and also not be surprised. I could see him kind of working with a really special mechanic, where his campaign focuses around supporting all the other Lizardmen factions. So Oxyodal, Krokgar, Mazdamundi, all of them. You'd be sending aid to them, you'd be making sure that they are protected, because at the end of the day what you're here to do is to further the advancement of the Great Plan. So if any of the other Lizardmen factions got destroyed, rather than confederating them, you'd be bringing them back. There'd be a reason to work with the other Lizardmen factions. You could still confederate them, because obviously these options should exist all the time but yeah i don't know i kind of like the idea of this maybe creative assembly have some better ideas but i, I would love to see tetoeko i think he's a pretty cool character and then lastly a legendary hero the lizardmen already have one with lord croak one of the um, absolute best to be honest but it would be nice to get a melee legendary hero also this is Chakax, also known as the Eternity Warden. He is a temple guard. You can see him with a nice great weapon. The model's absolutely cool. Lizardman characters always had some of the best models. The uh, Taurus, not so much, like the normal uh, <laughs> units. But those got updated for Age of Sigma, and I'm slowly trying to think, well, could I justify buying some of them to use for Old World? Because uh, I have a lot of Saurus, to be honest. <laughs> but yeah, this character is known basically for being one of the greatest defenders of Lizard Mankind. He's incredibly powerful. Essentially, it's been stated he's been able to take out armies by himself as he's protecting Slan by himself. But like, really, really competent in warfare. I could see him being a great character killer and, yeah, buffing up Saurus and Temple Gods to give you a reason to use them more. Because uh, at certain points, some people just go for a monster, which, to be honest, I do the same too. But it would be kind of cool just to, like, buff these lads up. I mean, in a perfect world, we'd have a Skink Legendary Hero also. But really, I can only see just one happening. But yeah, as you can see, there's not much that needs to be done in terms of content to finish the Lizard Men. It's just more they need an update. I could do with one DLC more, and I think a lot of people could do too, uh, just to finish them off fully and be done with them, and actually just say, look, we're done with Lizard Men, don't expect anything else. But hey, time will tell. I'm just thinking about it this way. I really want to play Lizard Men. I've been painting a bunch of them recently, and it's been kind of cool. And it makes me, when I paint up armies, it makes me want to play them on Total Ball too. But then I deal with the uh, geomantic web and the tech tree and I just don't want to. <laughs> but yeah, what do you guys think about these ideas? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. It's always great to talk about these types of things. And have a great day, everyone. I'll see you very, very soon. I'm glad that you guys are enjoying this series. I've got a bunch of ideas for videos coming out this week. I've just been really swamped as it's the start of a new financial year for me. So, you know, redoing contracts and stuff like that. You know, all the fun stuff with government offices, which isn't really fun and... Just absolutely exhausting. <laughs> Hopefully it's done soon. Have a great day, guys. See you soon.